I'm gonna start with a with a story. So I, I apologize. I woke up around 30 minutes ago. <laughs> Let's make this exciting! Yay! Who's excited? Woo! Yeah, make some noise! So make, make, make me wake up! Thank you! I just want to say first that I'm truly in love with Romania. This is exactly the same as Portugal. Like, all the quirks are still here. Like, everyone just parks wherever. Like, the default color of cars is just dirty. And um, it's, it's madness and chaos in the streets, and I love it. I feed on chaos. I, I am like a horrible driver. I, I yell at everyone, but I love driving, and this town is perfect. <laughs> what? Oh, no, 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 okay. No, not too much. Like, I went to Milan. That was too much chaos. Jesus. Okay, so, story time. Yay. So, this is a story of how I fell in love with style guides. And um, basically what happened is, I used to work in a company where, like, uh, we were, like, 40 people in one project, and no one liked CSS. This was before I found out that literally no one liked CSS. So can somebody raise their hands of who likes CSS, but not a love-hate relationship, just a love relationship? Can you please go and work for my, li li by my old company? Because we fucking need some of those. And like, no one liked CSS. I think I was hired mainly because I, only, I liked CSS. So I was the CSS ma magician at that company. By magician, I mean I made flex things. It's not like a fancy thing. I just made flex things work. And they were like, oh my god, how'd you do this? Two lines of code. Okay, so this is the story of how I fell in love with style guides. And, uh, like, we had a lot of legacy CSS. And a lot is mainly, it, it's a lot. Like, the moment you wrote CSS, about a week later, it was legacy. Like, it's like... Because the thing is, like, it was so, like, drilled down. And, like, it was there for so long that, it, like, when you wrote it, it was just like, you, you, could, you, couldn't, you couldn't help it. And, like, in reality, it was legacy less, which... You think it would be better because you got like variables and stuff, but like in reality, all it did is turn like turn this into this, and that was it, which was slightly better, but not really. It was like it just made the files a lot bigger. Oh. Okay, in order to get like a full grasp of the rest of the part, you need to understand how. Uh, oh, there's a, okay. How um, specificity works in CSS. So, for example, if you have one element that's worth one point. It's actually worth about like 0.2, but woke up 20 minutes ago, math, failed math in high school, we're not doing that. And a class is worth 10 points, an ID is worth 100, and inline style is worth 1,000. I don't know who came up with this, but uh, in order to override an ID with a class, you have to use 11 classes. This is why people tell you not to use IDs. If you ever get this question at, a, at an interview, because I used to do this question, it's that. It's that. People just usually say that's like, because you can only have one ID, and it's like, no, that's fine. The problem is that it's going to be there forever. It can never go away. But the thing is, important overrides all of this. And we had a problem with importance. I'll tell you about my problem with importance. Okay. So if important overrides all of this, how do you override this? Like, this was a thing that was a problem. So we had like a button that less, where all the buttons got their stuff. And the button that less had an important in it. And like, at the bottom of the pile, at an important end. So how do you override that important? Well, I mean, how do you override it without like inline styles? Because every time you use inline styles, a kitten dies. Okay? I don't know about you, but I got some feelings, like three different types of feelings. Only two of them are anger. So don't kill kittens. I have one, okay? They're fucking adorable. You override it with a tag. Because like, it, 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 you may think, no, no one does that. I've done this so many times. So many times. So basically, you go like all the way down in the specificity world, and you're like, you know what I'm going to overwrite this with? A body tag. There was a ton of body tags like in that, in that code. So we had an important problem. We had literally a problem with importance. And um, after a while, we started using post-CSS instead of using less. And uh, that's when I created a plugin for post-CSS. And what this plugin does is that, this is in Portuguese, but basically what this plugin does is that if you write important, it does absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's just, no, 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 the best part is coming, wait. You gotta write curse words for it to do important stuff. 
So basically, this was only in Portuguese by the time that I made it. So it forced everyone to put like curse, Portuguese curse words in the code base, and they started feeling bad. So they stopped using importance. And it was great. <laughs> and it actually worked. Like, people stopped using importance basically because they felt ashamed of using importance. After a while, like, uh, I moved into style components and I also made a Babel plugin that does exactly the same thing, but just for like, for the sake of it. Okay, so this is my story of how I started using style guides. After this, after this whole thing of like using this plugin uh, for, a, for a very long, this was lasted for like two months. I had to like manually override all the importance with curse words in Portuguese as well. And like ship it to master so that it wouldn't be like a pull request because that would have been fucking awkward. <laughs> and um, after all of this, we, we were, um, this was an Angular 1 app. And you're like, yeah, that makes it better, I know, right? So there's a bunch of timeouts and a bunch of importance. And um, we were, uh, at a time, we were like, you know, we should, you should use React, because like, it's like 2016 or something, and we should use React. And then when you started using React, I was like, no, we're making a style guide. And they're like, you don't know what the fuck that is. And I'm like, yeah, I do. I searched it on the internet, I saw, I saw a talk about two days ago, we're making a style guide because I can't live like this anymore, okay? I wanna become an Uber driver by this point. And they were like, okay, okay, Sarah, you, ma you make your own style guide. And it's like, no one's gonna use it. Everyone fucking used it. Okay, so my name is Sarah. I'm a full stack, I'm the other Sarah. I'm a full stack developer at YLD. I am Nikita FTW 2 ks on Twitter because the first one was taken by the TV show. I really like football and I really like horror movies. I'm from Portugal, uh, like Alex said, and uh, if you don't quite remember us, we won the Euro, and no one knows how the fuck that happened. <laughs> I don't know how the fuck that happened either. But it's like one of those like magical moments where like everything comes together and now we're the new Greece, where no one knows, but okay. So let's actually do a talk about stuff that's important and not like the shame of my country. So, style guide driven development, yay! Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna go over is what it is, how you, should, how you can implement it. Some of these parts will be React specific, but there are versions of it for Angular and Vue. I tend to just use React. And why the fuck you should do it? Okay, so what is style guide driven development? It's basically just a change in perspective. Like every single person in here can do it. It's just a basically a change in perspective. Because imagine that you get something like this and uh, what you're gonna do is basically like start, start hacking away in your JSX or your view files or your Angular template files. And that is, that is not how designers think, for example. The idea is that we need to think a little bit more like designers. Designers break everything into building blocks. And they don't do this because they, they, they want to be smarter than you. No, also, maybe, not sure. How many designers have we met? Like a third of them maybe do that. But they do this because it's way more maintainable for them and they're actually trying to help us. They're actually trying to say like, these are the blocks, you should maybe make these blocks, but they don't want to be dicks about it, so they just make a different sketch file. And that's about it. And so the first thing that you're gonna do is start hacking away in your JSX or your view files or the webpacks or Actually, now with Webpack 4, you don't have to hack away that much, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Hashtag remember Webpack 1. Um, yeah. Hashtag remember Grunt. That was pain. <laughs> and uh, what happens is, like, you make that page. Okay, cool. It looks dope. You're going to go to all your friends, and they'll be proud of you, because all your friends are nerds, I guess. And, um, and it's going to look dope. But the thing is, like, somebody's going to give you another page. And then you're like, fuck, so now I gotta copy all the stuff from the other page. And custom CSS is the death of a developer. Like, I know this is very, like, deep, but I woke up literally 30 minutes ago, so excuse me. And um, custom CSS is the death of a developer. The idea of CSS, in my mind, as someone who actually likes CSS, is that you should write it once, and you should never fucking touch it again. That is the idea. So is Opera Mini the death of a developer, but that's like a talk for another day. Who, is, who here has worked with Opera Mini? Oh, poor Matthias. <laughs> your, 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 your browser is better. Okay, so Opera Mini uh, is this thing for when you have, you pay a lot of money for mobile data, and it's just so bad. 
it's like incredibly bad because it doesn't support anything in CSS basically except Flexbox. And so if you want to make border radius, you got to go all 1999 on that motherfucker and um, put images on it. So it kind of is supposed to save you data, but then you eventually just start downloading a whole bunch of stuff that you could actually do with CSS, but it doesn't support it. Okay, so what is the idea that I'm trying to convey? Very fancy word right now. Okay, so you have that design that I just showed you, and the idea is that you pick up that design and you try to split it into components. You try to like abstract your incredible need of creating reactor view or angular stuff. And you're like, no, no, I gotta chill, okay? I gotta chill, and I gotta like think about this in a component way. Because there's gonna be more pages. Like, if you make a website that's just one page for the rest of his life, I, I'm, I'm, I, I love you, I know you're so lucky. But usually, no. <laughs> And so divide that thing into components. And uh, yeah, there we go. So basically get typography, get buttons, get, get the icons, get the cards, get everything, and make components out of it. So as a recap of how it is, what it is, I was like, style guide driven development is a mentality. It's not a skill. Like, everyone can do this. It's not, it's not hard at all. I failed math twice in high school. It's not hard. So it's more of like, trying to escape the thing that we've always had of being, of getting like a, uh, a sketch file or like a PSD. Does anyone still use Photoshop for this type of stuff? No? Okay, good. Sketch file or Figma file or whatever it is and uh, not, like, not start like writing code or like just start writing code. Because that's what we like. But no. Like think about it from somehow of a designer perspective and try it and divide it into little building blocks. Exactly what I just said, yes. So think of your website as something from a design standpoint and not just ones and zeros because that's how we think of, of stuff but that's not how a designer thinks of stuff. And in order for us to actually understand each other, we need to kind of speak the same language. And we can't teach all designers to code, and neither I think we should. And we can't teach all front-end developers to design, because that would be horrible. <laughs> that would make, you know, it was like a bootstrap web all over again. Remember that? That was like five years ago. Every website was bootstrap. And think of your website from a designer standpoint. Think of your website as blocks. Okay, so now you know what it is, and you're probably like, I don't care, but the, the, the thing has to continue because I gotta stay here for 40 minutes, I'm so sorry. So tools that you can use to actually make this happen. These, one of them is uh, React specific, the other one has things for Angular and Vue, I think. No, I think Angular, I'm sure of Vue. So first one that I'm gonna talk about is React Style Guidest. I have stickers of React Style Guidest. I have stickers of both. So as long, whatever you use, just do this, please. Like, you can make you happy, I promise. And uh, since there were no React Style Guidance boilerplates on the internet, I created a simple Style Guidance boilerplate. This will, I will share all of these links like on Twitter and everything. So you git clone this and you CD into it, delete the git stuff and just yarn start it, or NPM, or sorry Jeff, yarn start it. Jeff works for NPM. I'm not even sure he's here. And you get something like this. Uh, which is this. Okay, so what do you get from the start is something that you're like, that's not pretty. Chill, okay? Chill. And uh, you get something, so imagine this is a basic button, you get the code here, and you can actually change the code, like, lol. And it changes it. Like, lol me, yeah, that's what I think about every day when I wake up, actually. Thank you, computer. And um, you can change the code, and you can even, you can, what it this does is that it reads markdown files. So, uh, you know the README files that you usually have on your open source project but no one reads them? React Style Guide just reads them like a good human. I love it. So you have a component and then you have a README.md file which automatically imports that component and you can write to JSX in it and you will render the component that is exported default on your, um, on your JS file, which is great. Uh, and this is about what you get, but the thing about the thing about React Style Guidance is that React Style Guidance is completely customizable. Like, it's built on top of React, so, and the thing is like, it gives you all of the tools that you need to customize it. For example, at the moment at YLD, uh, we're a consultancy, and at this moment I am working for Joyent, a uh, cloud computing thing, and we made them a style guide, and 
it looks like this, which looks absolutely nothing like what you saw. So if you go like here to the buttons, I don't know why I'm looking over there, my computer's here. And you get like tabs, and you get like the disable button, and then the code, and secondary button, and like tables, stuff like that. And it's completely different from what I just showed you. Because the thing about React Style Guidance is that it allows you to change completely everything about the actual style guide. You're not forced to use that little thing if you don't like it. No, this is, this is not, okay, there we go. Okay, so how do you use it? So, uh, imagine that you have an app, you have a style guide that config, because what is life without a config file? And then you have like package.json, bubblerc, yes, lint, because you should always lint all the things. And you have, in the, uh, you have a source component, and there's a component called bun. It has an index.js, a bun.js, and a bun.css. All this index.js does is like, so imagine that you have a, uh, um, a folder called form. Uh, if you don't create an index.js, you're just going to import stuff from like slash form slash input. Instead of this, you just import from form. And you, ex you export it out of form, like not as a default, but as a normal export. And the style guide that config is basically like a very small chunk of a webpack config. So first thing that you do is that you tell it where your components are. This says like it's in source slash components slash anything, whatever the fuck you want, and anything from A to Z that ends in JS. Default example is a thing that they do in dev mode, which is like if you forget to put an example, they will tell you. They're gonna be like, yo, you're missing something. It won't show up in production, so it's more of a reminder for you to add examples of stuff and actually document your stuff. Uh, next part is the title. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Then you got a webpack and figure like, oh no, it's just two rules, okay, it's fine. So you test for JS or JSX, and uh, you just use the Babel loader, create a Babel RC, exclude known modules by default, and then you load CSS. I honestly now use CSS and JS, but uh, that doesn't lead the loader, so. So you test for CSS, you give it to the CSS loader, and then to the style loader, it just slaps it in your page, because Webpack works the other way around, as in like the normal way of thinking. And then you have a button.js. This is where you make all your things that are now great, I guess. So you import like all the things that you need, so prop types, the button.css, and the React, and you create a button. So you define your components, that it gets all of these props, and you create some styles, and then literally you just return the component. This is what you usually do. Like you have to change nothing about your approach, but I would recommend you to use something like the prop types, because you get that in the documentation. So if I, if I come here, and there's a thing called props and methods, which will tell you all the prop types that this, uh, this actually gets. So this is the type, this is if it's required, or the default, and it also gives you a description. And this is all read from, um, from this, from the prop types. It also uh, understands flow and TypeScript. So uh, you can see that it has a description here, and the color is a prop type of string. It can also do like prop types one of, and it will show up in there, which is very useful. Also, default props, and that's about it. Then in the README, it automatically imports that index, and you can just use your button. So use a button, and you can render with props that you can change in the, in the client side, or your designers can change in the client side, or your QA team can change in the client side, and then send a ticket back. That's fun. You can also disable the editor. And this is like one of those things that you're like, why would I want to do this? Maybe because you have pages like this, which makes no sense for you to have an editor here. Like this is still a page in React Style Guidance, but it doesn't make sense for you to like be editing the stuff because this is just text. So disable the editor. And you can also render examples as static text. So you just write, for example, JS or HTML or CSS static, and it will render normal text. What are the advantages of, of this one? Like it can be used with Preact, and I'm a really, pre I really, I, I really like Preact for some reason. And it can be used with Preact. Uh, the design is completely customizable. And this is what I usually say about this uh, React style guide is that if you want to share this with the world, you can do whatever you want. The world is your oyster. Like, you, you can change the design completely and it's still usable. And that is a very good thing. And it has a live editor, which is very good. Like, you can change stuff without any plugins or anything. It just comes built in. And your component definition is in Markdown. And this means that you get automatic documentation. Uh, that's so good. Storybook JS. So Storybook actually exists for um, 
View and uh, React. Yeah, View and React. I think they're making an Angular version as well. So as well, there's a simple boilerplate. I will share all of this. It was like the same thing. Yarn it and yarn start it. And, uh, and you get something like, just close the other tabs, otherwise I'm going to get lost. And you get something like this. This is the default thing that you get with uh, Storybook, which you may think like it doesn't look that amazing. Because Storybook relies a lot on add-ons. There are add-ons for everything. There's an add-on for Figma, and that API has been out for like three weeks. This team is dope. Like you have add-ons for everything. You have add-ons for Figma, for Sketch, for GraphQL, anything you could ever want and need in life, you have add-ons for it. And you know, the first add-on that you should install is basically an action logger that just tells you stuff. And you can, this is basically the example that you get from the default. And now let me come here, yeah. So this has a, uh, a slightly different structure. So you have an app and you have the components. The components are exactly the same except that it doesn't have a readme file. And then you have a dot storybook where you put your storybook configuration. And then you have your stories. The that out is the build. You can rename it to whatever you want. And then button.js is exactly the same thing. So we import it, you define it, and you export it and define prop types, and that's about it. And the way that storybook works is that every single component is a story. And that's why it's called storybook. I guess. I'm not sure. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure. So to create stories, you got to go on stories and create one with the name of your, of your, um, of your component. So you import React and, or Vue or whatever you use for creating this. And you import stories of from storybook.react. There's, that's why it's storybook.react instead of being just storybook. It's, there's also storybook slash view. And you import action from the add-on actions. And uh, you import your button. And basically, like, you define the name of the story. So stories of button. You can rename it to whatever you want, like chicken shortage, whatever you want. And this, will, this is basically like a describe statement in jest. And this is like, this is all the things that belong to the button. That's about it. And then we got your it's. So you add a story that has with text, and um, basically it runs a function that returns that button, and on click you call this action. Nope. You call this action that we imported right here, because this is an add-on that's just like a logger for clicking events and everything. And that's about it. So you can render with other things, and it's a very easy way of understanding as well. So nothing, the thing about this one is that nothing is magical. Like for something to be able to be seen in your storybook, you really have to think about it. And uh, it has to be, like, you have to create the stories for it. So the config is actually super simple. So you import configure from uh, storybook at React, you load the stories, and you require some stories. You have to require every single story that you have. And, uh, or you can create an index.js that just exports all of them. And you configure load stories and attach it to the model. So that configuration, exactly. Good thing about this, like, it can be used with Vue. I, I honestly like Vue because I think Vue, I see Vue as like the little kitten of web frameworks. It's so adorable. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a kitten and I like it. Like, I use, I use it a lot for like personal stuff. It has a lot of add-ons. Like this, this has a, a link to the add-ons page. It has a lot of add-ons that you can use, including GraphQL, uh, everything. Uh, it has automatic testing. It has automatic accessibility testing, which is very, very good that you should never forget. It has like a knobs plugin, which allows you to change props and everything like that. It has an integrated console, like you saw, like you saw here, because you can. I just, I just logged something random, but you can log whatever you want. Actually, this one is not logging, but this one, you can log whatever you want. And your component definition is in plain JSX. So I was like, this is a good thing also for Markdown, because I'm like, if you don't give me a configuration file, I am fine. It's like, I have bad dreams with Grunt still. Hashtag remember Grunt. And uh, we, the, we, yeah, it's here, yeah. So now you're like, okay, this sounds pretty amazing, but how do I integrate this in a project and in an actual team that has developers and designers and other human beings and stuff like that? So for developers, like you can like create a style guide, like use your own Reaper in a separate folder, and that's like the 90, the 9099 way of doing things. But it kind of works, I guess. You can create an npm package and with versioning and keep updating that. But the thing about this problem that I saw that this was the first approach that we did was that you keep breaking it, 
and uh, it's not fun uh, like keep upgrading the stuff. So it starts being a problem because on the beginning you don't have a pretty thing. Like you have this weird ass style guide and you have to keep changing stuff. And you can use LearnNet to create a mono repo. Uh, who here knows what LearnNet is? Okay, so LearnNet is basically a tool by Facebook because we use everything that Facebook makes except their own website. Because it's creepy, okay. So LearnNet is a tool made by, by the amazing Facebook developers and what it does is you can have a multi multiple um, NPM packages in the same repository and just in different folders, but they have independent NPM versions. They are completely independent of each other. They can run, uh, you can just like yarn start it in the start and it just runs all of them in parallel. It's, it's a pretty good thing. Uh, we've been using this and the way that you can use it, you can, you can actually like publish it to NPM or by default, if you like symlink it, it will just use the one that's there instead of using the one that's on NPM. So when you feel comfortable, you release a new version, but you can always use the latest version, so the broken one. For designers, well, you can have all your design folders in Dropbox. That's the way, and like if all of them have the underscore final in the end of it, and you never really know. Is it, is it final 14 or final 15? I honestly, like imagine being a designer for a week and you don't have Git. Like, we make fun of this, but like, imagine not having Git. That, that's, that, that's gotta suck. There is a tool for Sketch. Uh, if uh, your designer team uses Sketch, that's called Cactus, which is basically like a Git. Uh, it has diffing and everything for Sketch, which is very good. And use Figma. So I'm not sponsored by Figma, neither do I work for them in any particular way, but Figma is dope. Like, Figma is basically like a tiny version of Sketch in the browser, so that means that it works everywhere. So Sketch only works on Macs, uh, so you have to like export it to like Zeppelin or something to be able to work on Windows. Figma is web-based, and it's written on React, I think. Uh, and it offers really cool things, like real-time collaboration is a really cool thing, you can have comments, you have version history for designers, which for us is just like, yeah, get, you don't understand the pain of them. And it's browser-based, which is very good. It has a desktop app, which is, okay. And like it works on everything. It literally works on everything. It has integrations with Slack, it has integrations with Framer. If you don't know what Framer is, it's basically a tool for um, creating like, uh, like mock-ups for designers to create, but it's like, it's, it's really cool. My designer in my old company used it. He learned CoffeeScript. Because it's written on CoffeeScript. It has like a presentation mode that allows you to make like animations from side to side and stuff like that. And it's like email and Slack notifications, do not turn them on. And Figma has an API. And it's, when something releases an API, the world of developers just goes like, yes, I'm gonna do it, shit with it. So awesome stuff came out of the Figma API. So this is a Figma to PDF export. And basically you get all your Figma files and you just put them in here and it gives you a PDF. And you can send your PDF to whatever you want and they will get an idea of what you're doing. This is Figma.js, which is a wrapper around the Figma API. It's like an SDK around the Figma API so that you can get all the stuff from it. This is something that I've done with Bernardo. It's Figma GraphQL. It's basically a GraphQL connector to the Figma.js and to the Figma API. Because I, don't, I, I started using GraphQL about a year and a half ago and I can't go back. It's honestly like I either go all JSON files or GraphQL. If there's something in between, I cry a bit. Like I use it, but I, I, I'm just like, it was so much easier with Apollo. And what about React components? Well, yours truly has a lot of free time. Uh, so this is something that is built on React and comes from Figma. So this is the Figma file that I used. And this is the React app. It actually kind of works. And if you don't believe me, it's all on Code Sandbox. It also has, allows you to have actions. This is what I'm trying to work on. This is like the name. This is not done like at all. Zero done. And uh, you can have also custom styles for stuff. So in this case, I added a border radius of 50 and a border of none, and it has a cursor pointer. And if I come here, you can see that it actually has a cursor pointer and that it actually works. And the actions also work. Shit, no? Oh yeah, it does. Look, J0, so sup? So, this is not production ready. <laughs> no shit. Like, it's literally still on Code Sandbox. But it's something. Like, 
And it wasn't that easy. It wasn't that hard. Sorry about that. It's just a lot of recursion on recursion. And well, it's, it's on Code Sandbox. You can use it however you feel. Please don't use it on production. I know this doesn't work when, Mac, uh, when Dan Abramov says don't use it on production, but please don't, because it all relies on position absolute. And do you really want that? No. Um, so maybe React components. Maybe I can get this to work with Flexbox and something. And then, basically, you can export your Figma file, and all of your components are on a style guide in Figma, and just turn it into React components. And that would be dope. Because if you put them all in different pages, because this is, this, like, what I did doesn't really work if you have, like, a gigantic page. But it, like, it kind of works for small stuff. So it's a really cool thing for you to, like, export little things and use them everywhere. Everywhere on React. And you're like, okay, that, that, sounds like, that sounds like a thing that exists that you just made up, but okay. But why should I do this? You have way more maintainable styles. Like, it's insane. It's insanely maintainable. So the, this project that I'm in, we have zero, zero CSS in the actual project. All of the CSS in JS is on the style guide. There is no CSS pretty much except for like icons and stuff. So like all the greens are now the same green because there's only one green. It's amazing. You have way less specific bugs. So I used to have a lot of bugs that were like when, like, when there's a full moon and the werewolf comes to town, this green is not the same as that green. All the same green. Dope. And also have one source of truth. This is the best thing if you're dealing with project managers or something where just like, it's not supposed to look like this. Well, it looks like this on the style guide, so that's what I'm doing. And then you can just walk away. I have done this. It was dope. I didn't get fired. You can totally do it. And even I got promoted to team lead. So I, I didn't get a pay raise, though. I was promoted. It was like, oh, oh, you want to you lead a team? I was like, yeah. What, what, do I get a, t a pay raise? What? No. Oh, OK. Do I have a choice? Uh, no. Oh, OK. It's so much better for unit testing. Like, the idea of unit testing is not to test like your entire home page. And, uh, that's, that's not the idea. So the, the unit, unit testing was, it began as an idea to test one function. In React, our functions are our components, so you test components. And the best idea is to test small components. It's not to test entire, compo entire trees of DOM nodes and everything. So you get an isolated thing for it. You can isolatedly test your components. It's, it's beautiful, I promise. In my opinion, like UI development is generally better. Because you have one source of truth, and you also, you don't have to write override CSS every time you do something. Because you can uh, React and view, and, and I don't know, I haven't worked with Angular since version one, but we have props. Like, we have props that we can pass it that completely change the component. Don't have a component that does everything, like Jack said. Don't have, like, this is the home page component. That's not how it works. Uh, but, you can change things, and you can make it better, and you can change the design, you can change everything, you can be a happier human being. Sometimes it's a choice. And that is my talk. Thank you so much. My slides are in there, and they're also on Code Sandbox.